Please be mindful of those who are traveling. There's a lot of people who are out on vacation on the roads. A lot of people who are sick. I think we're down about 25 on a regular step. I don't expect to be here this morning. I've the same number tonight, but we are glad that you're here. And tonight we do have visitors that I want to tell you about. There's a couple sitting behind Bill and Renee Morrison for the community. And uh, you, when I tell you their story, I think you'll want to shake their hand before they go. Dorothy and Ralph Cannon are here tonight. And Mr. Cannon's family, the Cannon family, owned this property on which this building was built, going all the way back to about the 1800s, about 100 years. It was in uh, that family's name. And uh, back in 94, uh, they sold uh, this property uh, uh, to us. And then began making the payments it was about six years ago. Uh, we moved in the building, I guess, five and six years. So we're thankful to the Kennedy family. And, uh, I found out they went to the school at Carter, graduated in 1970. Class, what, classmates of my wife, Nancy. And so uh, good to be able to talk to them. I know someone that knew a little bit about our past. So we're, we're grateful for you coming our way. Uh, please, the members here, uh, greet them before they leave. And thank you again for coming and for your contribution to our being in this place. It was for many years that we. I uh, thought about what we could get out here. It would be great. The Lord certainly blessed us while we have been here. Uh, team 2, we meet tonight uh, in the fellowship hall as soon as we conclude our worship service and get your assignments for the week. You know, some illustrations we hear, you remember for a lifetime. I know some we forget, but I know I realized uh, long ago when I began preaching, you may have a particular sermon outline that uh, people will soon forget. But some illustrations. Stay with you for a long time. I remember years ago when I was still preaching, someone came to talk to us about the importance of prayer, and they used it. To, they used uh, an illustration called Barefoot City to talk about prayer. They talked about this imaginary city way up north where nobody wore the shoes. Now you can imagine what it would be like in cold in winter, you know, ice and snow everywhere, and there are people huddled around going in and out of shops and Waiting on the bus, cold heavy coats on, but standing there shivering with no shoes. And you'd go up there, you'd think, that, don't you people believe in shoes? Well, they say, oh, of course we do. We own shoes. They're, they're at home. And in fact, there's a shoe factory right down the street. A lot of people in the community work there at that shoe factory. In fact, about once a week, a guy gets up and extols all the virtues of wearing shoes. Why don't you wear them? Well, I don't know. And the preacher emphasized this about prayer. How many people believe in prayer? Everybody believes in prayer. Do you pray all? Are you happy with the prayer? Like most people would say, no, that's the application. It's kind of like, you know, it didn't make any sense to have a place up in the cold where people would live without shoes would still shouldn't make any sense at all for Christians to say, I believe in prayer, but not to pray. If you don't make it to heaven, one of the reasons why you probably won't is because your prayer life is not what it should be. We uh, realized very early on in life that every organization, every institution, the importance of communication. God has communicated His will to us. And we communicate back to Him through prayer. What's the purpose of prayer? If your prayer life is not what it should be, why is it? Here's a question to ask. You know, does God answer prayer? The answer is yes, God answers every prayer. It may not be what we want. And that's part of the problem. Maybe the reason why you back off and maybe don't pray at all like you should, because the answer is always no, you can see. So that's not the case at all. Sometimes it's helpful to, to look at some of the ways in which God has answered some of the prayer requests of some great Bible heroes. During that tonight, I've got four different examples. We won't cover them all, but maybe we can cover the first two. But why God, in some cases, said no, and why God, in other cases, said not now, maybe later. And maybe we can draw some comparisons when we finish that. Hopefully, those of you whose prayer life is not what it should be, perhaps you'll be encouraged more so to begin to embrace the great the privilege of prayer so God can bless you. If I was getting a phrase started, you probably could finish it, James 4, verse 2. You have not because you ask not. So we need to be mindful of that. If you're not asking prayer and, uh, often, then the problem is not with God, it is with you, us, and our understanding. If you will, let's begin the Old Testament book of Numbers. Go with me back to the book of Numbers. 
We first of all want to talk about Moses and the particular prayer request that he had. And ultimately, even after a number of requests, the answer was no. Why would God tell Moses, of all people, no? Here was a man who had the most daunting, the most challenging task anybody has ever asked to be given by God. To be able to lead a nation as they prepared in the wilderness, God let go to Moses at the age of 80 go and get my people out of bondage. He did with all the miracles that God had performed through him, all the plagues. And then they were able to gain their freedom from the Pharaoh's army. They all died there in the water. As uh, Israel safely crossed over the Red Sea, Pharaoh's soldiers followed behind and God destroyed them. They shouldn't have to worry ever again about Egypt coming up and following them, but there were other things. About a year after they left, they gathered there to the edge of the Promised Land, sent the 12 spies in. You know the story. But they were afraid. They lacked the courage to go in. And because of that, God told Moses, you go back. He marched in the wilderness. And for 40 years, Moses had that daunting task of trying to get that nation ready. There was an incident, however, that happened where Moses disobeyed God. You can probably understand that frustration. Why? But let's begin reading in Numbers chapter 20, verse 2. And see the context. Number chapter 20, verse 2. Now there was no wonder for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended. They fought with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place. It's not a place of grain or figs or vines or palm granite stores. Is there any water to drink? So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. And they fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. We see this particular incident. Why Moses had such a difficult task. Were those people content with being slaves? No. For hundreds of years. Glory God, send somebody to help us get out of this place. There was a whining, a murmuring, a complaining, a lot of people. The reason why most of those people, at least the men of fighting age, all died in the wilderness. Another generation was raised up. And Moses had to deal with these people. Now for all those years, and here again, is one of those incidents that certainly troubled Moses in there. Verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take your rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Um, we notice there's a departure from what God said. God said, speak. And Moses, no doubt, in his frustration and weirdness and anger, instead, smote the rock twice. That's not what God said to do. Verse 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended to the Lord, and it was hallowed among them. So here, to most people today, would seem to be a minor incident. But nevertheless, I think most of you know, much is given, much is required. Look at James chapter 3. It says, Be not very many of your teachers or masters, knowing that you will incur the stricter and the greater judgment. What then would be the standard that God would hold for Moses and Aaron? A very strict standard. And because Moses did not obey God, God said, You will see the consequence. You will not be able to lead Israel into the promised land. Some people would say that's harsh. But nevertheless, it's something that God decided to do. Now turn with me over to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy. Begin reading with me, verse 26. Deuteronomy, of course, is a book that contains three long sermons, discourses that Moses presented to that nation after all those years of wonder. 
wonders are over. They're getting ready to go to the promised land. Now Moses is preparing that generation to do that. Telling them, giving them the charge, what should their priorities be, what to look out for, and what sins not to fall into. Again, in verse 26, as he provides basically a summary of the history of what had happened to that generation, especially the one before them, and now you're with us. Nevertheless, you would not go up but rebel against the command of the Lord your God. That's what he's talking about. Kind of pick up the story. When they refused to go in and fight because uh, the enemy there was very large. And you complained in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, he's brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren are discouraged and our hearts saying, The people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great. Fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we've seen the sons of the Anakim there. But I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness, when you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son, and all the way that you went until you came to this place, yet for all that you did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search out a place for you, to pitch your tents, to show you the way you should go, and the fire by night and the cloud by day. And the Lord heard the sound of your word and was angry and took an oath, saying, Surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see that good land of which I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and to him and his children I have given the land on which he walked, because he wholly followed the Lord. The Lord was also angry with me for your sake, saying, Even you shall not go in there. Here's a key verse. Look what's said. The Lord was also angry with me for your sakes, saying, Even you shall not go in there. Drop down to chapter 20, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 21. As we go through the transition of leadership. Moses and Joshua. And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. So will the Lord do all the kings through which you pass. You must not fear them, for the Lord your God himself fights for you. Then I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, you've begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand for what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds, I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains, and Lebanon. For the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak to me no more of this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah. Lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, and the east. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan, but command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you will see. So we stay in the valley of the city. So just to summarize, we'll see the time is going already tonight. Here's Moses, God's faithful and humble servant. On the occasion, when he got mad, instead of speaking to the rock, Instead of following God's command, doing what God asked, he departed from that and smelt the rock twice, and he began to ask God to change his mind. And God said, for their sake, for their account, Moses, the answer is no. And rather, here's the lesson that we gather. Sometimes the request that we have, that we would seem to be so practical and so needed, that we may go to God again and again and again because we think it would be right, we think it would be helpful for the sake of someone else. Maybe, respect, maybe for the sake of the spouse or for our children, for our family, or maybe for the sake of the church. God will say, no, you'll keep that because of a greater good. And I think someone else. Now, folks, that's a hard challenge. But nevertheless, some of you perhaps in your own life have had occasions Things that you did not like, maybe a thorn in the flesh. We talked about that here in the Sunday or two. Where there's something that you implored God again and again and again. You prayed sincerely, fervently, followed all the rules of prayer that you know 
on the Bible, but nevertheless, the answer was continued to be no. If that's God's answer, here it is. It's for the best for you, maybe for other people. But God will say no and deny you of something of passion that you desire so completely and so thoroughly. God knows what's best. For the sake of the nation, for the sake of the nation, God told Moses no. There's a lesson to learn with that. Imagine if you will. There's a nation for all these years. Who did they follow? There was Moses out front. It was a nation too big and strong, a large gathering of people out there in the desert, out there in the wilderness. But here they followed this good and godly and holy man for 40 years. Then the day came, Moses stepped out of the crowd. Joshua took the lead, and they marched on by and left them alone to die. I wonder what would be said the word would go out. Why is it Moses up front? Well, that teenagers and children asked, and then a father, mothers, people who would know would be told Moses sinned. Because God did not obey, or Moses did not obey God. God told Moses, no, for our sake, for the example we would learn, for the lesson that we would learn, he's mistaken. He'll get to go up and see it from afar. But the consequence that came because of his sin. He would be denied. That would be a lesson. I believe long remembered and long learned by that nation. For the sake of the nation, one of the best and God the best that ever walked the face of the earth, for the sake of the nation, God's answer to Moses' repeated prayer was no and finally said, Ask me no more for the sake of the nation. Rather, there are things that will happen to us in life that we will always deem unpleasant. But for the sake of maybe someone else, or maybe for our own sake, for our own eternal good, God will say, no. But brethren, if that's what it takes to get us closer to eternity, if that's what it takes to make the church stronger, and the sweet by and by as we stand before the judgment part of God, would it not be worth it? Would it not be worth it? I've talked to someone here not too long ago who was weary because of the, of the condition, the lack of help that they have. Causing them to basically be a shut in. Why, oh why am I confined to this bed? But I told them people are watching me. And it might be because of a good example, the lacking in their own parents, because of the grandchildren witnessing this honorable lady and her trying so very hard, maybe for their sake. God's allowed you in this particular challenge because if it got them closer to eternity, would it be worth it? She said, yes, it'd be worth it. That might be the answer, I don't know. But God knows what's best. When we pray, but here's what God wants us to do. Pray. Pray in faith and pray this way to the Lord. The night he was arrested, a few hours away, he had the last supper with the disciples. said, tonight all of you will betray me and flee. You know what, uh, what Peter said about me. But here he goes to the garden, takes Peter, James and John, a little bit further in the garden. And what does he pray? Lord, if it be possible, what did he pray? Let this cup of anguish pass from me. But, how did it finish? Thy will be done. Make me the first. The God. And at the end of that, your prayer should be, Thy will be done. Thy will be done. That's the way to pray. The purpose of prayer is not to be in God's will to the powers. The purpose of prayer is to be in our will to the will of God. If your prayer life is not what it should be, please, if you will, study prayer. Old and New Testament life. We'll give you all kinds of outline. They're all kinds of, I've got a dozen books in my life. Great lessons of prayer. Engage the process. Continue on for a life. If you've got hang-ups, objections, problems, let us be able to help you work through this. So that once again, very soon, that prayer life that you need, and that God deserves will be something that will be a thing for you that will that, that be good. Something that you'll want to do, not have to do, to do day by day. Tonight we extend invitation to those who are outside the body of Christ. I know what's going on in your life and time to time. That's the gathering. Even though small as we are tonight, 50 people, there might be someone who has a prayer request that I'd be going through a particular challenge. But you know on your own is not enough. You may want your brothers and sisters to know to pray for you for that. And if that's your need, you can come down.
and the I'll do that. Maybe you're ready to find it. But I'm the Lord Jesus in fact, you have your sins washed away. But time to begin to be a child of God to salve this night. Looking forward to that hope of heaven one day to be welcomed home. Whatever your need might be, think seriously about this now as together we stand and sing in the general voice. <clears throat>